As Washington, D.C.'s Central Library, the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Library serves D.C. residents from every neighborhood and culture in our city. With offerings ranging from maker's labs to town halls, co-working to concerts, we go well beyond books. Here, artists and activists, teachers and learners, toddlers and singers converge to explore our city's past and the infinite potential of its future. Because the MLK Library is not only a place to be quiet, it is a place to be heard, to be understood. It is a place to explore the possibility of all we can be. And it is a place to just be. Welcome to the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Library, celebrating 50 years as Washington, D.C.'s first memorial to Dr. King. Um, so with that, I'm going to introduce our, um, our author. Um, he's going to read for a short while, maybe about 10 minutes or so, um, and then we will have a little bit of banter back and forth, and then we will open it up to questions uh, from, from you all. Um, I will say before I introduce Richard that I did, um, I did read the book, um, uh, Lightning, Lightning Fast. It is heavy and large, but it is just a, a phenomenally uh, fast read. And uh, I think it's a tribute to uh, Richard's writing style that it is uh, just something you can take to the park with you or to our new roof deck here at the MLK Library. Um, it's, it's just eminently enjoyable and you'll feel a lot smarter when you're finished. So I recommend it um, highly. Uh, Richard Cohen is the author of By the Sword, Chasing the Sun, and How to Write Like Tolstoy. Uh, the former publishing director of two leading London publishing houses, he has edited books that have won the Pulitzer, Booker, and Whitbread Costa Prizes, while 21 of his books have been number one bestsellers. He has written for most UK quality newspapers as well as for the New York Times Book Review and the Wall Street Journal, and is a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature. Please join me in welcoming Richard Cohen. Thank you, thank you, Richard. And it's a, a real pleasure and an honor to be in this wonderful library. I've never been here before. Um, back in January, there was a short article in the New Yorker about Martin Luther King. And it was headed, History Lesson. And it was pointing out that Martin Luther King who never pretended to be a historian in the normally accepted sense, taught us a huge amount of important history. So talking about my book tonight, this seems the ideal place to do so. Although, um, considering that everything here seems so wonderful, I think I'm allowed to tease you, Richard, by saying that the publicity for tonight's event, um, you may have received this in your email, say that um, in my talk, Potatoes with roasted seaweed sour cream will demonstrate Eric's prowess at introducing Korean pantry essentials to comforting American classics. <laughs> well, if, if that's why you came, you may be a little disappointed. <laughs> I think that was a previous author here from the New York Times, a Korean author who was uh, pushing his, um, his recipes, I think. Anyway, apologies for that. No, it was a, it was a pleasure to... And apologies to you if you want Korean recipes from Richard Cohen, because uh, you're in for a shock. The, the book um, is about two and a half thousand years of how people have tried to tell us about the past. And the chapter that seems to have got the most play, I mean, is serialized in the Smithsonian um, and in Time and things like that, is a chapter which is called Bad History. And it's part of that chapter I thought I'd read you now. Most countries have supplied bits of history to order. From the recounting of the Spanish Armada to heroic tales of the Battle of Britain, British history is crowded with myths. The French thought themselves the decisive factor in the outcome of the First World War. Many in the United States have only a hazy notion of who helped them win the second. For decades, Israelis were taught that most Arabs had fled their country in the wake of the 1948 war, left voluntarily, the opposite of the truth. Kwame Nkrumah, president of Ghana from 1960 to 1966, commissioned huge murals to show European scientists being instructed by African predecessors, a fiction he deemed necessary for national self-respect. 
Rome's founding fathers, her cousins, to Britain's King Arthur. And when his emperors fell, their statues were pulled down and their likenesses on coins were erased. The Romans even had a phrase for such spoilations, damnatio memoriae, the condemnation of memory. History has ever been a harbour for dishonest writings, a home for forgers, the insane, or even history killers who write so dully they neutralise their subjects. Direct witnesses can be entirely unreliable. The travelogue of the 13th century explorer Marco Polo, covering his years in China, which he dictated while in prison in Genoa, to a romance writer who is his fellow inmate, is about two-thirds made up. But which two-thirds? Scholars are still debating. On July the 14th, 1789, Louis the 16th game book ent entry reads, Rien, this on the day of the storming of the Bastille. Dean Acheson, when writing his memoirs, which were published as present at the creation, reportedly called a friend to corroborate his memory of an important meeting. The friend said the description was accurate, except for one detail. Acheson hadn't been present. <laughs> Gerald Wellesley, the seventh Duke of Wellington, was an attache in St. Petersburg in 1912 and attended the imperial maneuvers when, amid great excitement, he was brought over to an unimaginably old Frenchman who claimed that when a small child, he saw Napoleon. He was a very small, a very tall man, Your Honor, with a long yellow beard. Evidently, to any sage of any, inv any invading emperor should be gigantic and Viking-like, and wishful thinking did the rest. Auschwitz survivors of Joseph Mengele's wild experiments recall him as tall and blonde and fluent in Hungarian. In fact, he didn't speak that language and was relatively short and dark-haired. The director of Yad Vashem Holocaust Memorial in Israel has said that most of the oral histories collected there were unreliable, however honestly contributed. Most countries, at one time or another, have been guilty of proclaiming false versions of their past. The late 19th century French historian Ernest Renan is known for his statement that forgetfulness is essential in the creation of a nation. His positive gloss on Goethe's blunt aphorism, patriotism corrupts history. But this is why nationalism often views history as a threat what governments declare to be true is one reality, the judgment of historians quite another. History always emphasizes terminal events. Albert Speer commented sharply to his American interrogators just after the end of the Second World War. He hated the idea that the earlier achievements of Hitler's government would be eclipsed by its final disintegration. I know it's the fashion to say that most of recorded history is lies anyway, wrote George Orwell in 1942, reflecting on pro-Franco propaganda in the aftermath of the, of the Spanish Civil War. I'm willing to believe that history is for the most part inaccurate and biased. But what is peculiar to our own age is the abandonment of the idea that history could be truthfully written. The problem continued to trouble him. Three years later, he went further. Already, there are countless people who would think it's scandalous to falsify a scientific textbook, but would see nothing wrong in falsifying an historical fact. The chapter then goes on to talk about two periods of history in two different countries um, who have falsified their history, probably more than any other nation in recent times. And of course, one of the obvious people to write about is Vladimir Putin. Well, this is all put together um, well before the, un the invasion of Ukraine. But what it does is describe how Putin has been determined um, after his first two or three years when he was the kind of love child for the West. 
in rewriting Russian history, just as President Xi um, last November said he intended to rewrite Chinese history. So Putin has forbidden textbooks which tell the truth about Stalin, the Gulag, and so on. Well, I won't go into that. You'll have to read it for yourselves. But I'll simply end by saying that Francis Bacon famously said that truth is the daughter of time, not of authority. Alexander Solzhenitsyn was once asked what would happen after the end of Soviet communism. His reply, a long, long period of healing. That would seem the more realistic judgment, so pernicious and enduring is bad history. Um, that was one of my favorite chapters, and I'm glad that you read from it. Um, I'll have some questions about it uh, later, later on. Um, I wanted to ask a few questions just about the actual construction of the book, um, if you wouldn't mind and, and just indulge me a little bit. Um, I understand that the book uh, took you 10 years uh, to write. Is that accurate? It's kind of selective history, because my book on the sun came out in 2010, so 12 years ago. And I then had what I thought was a brainwave. I thought, there's this book about history and the historians I've always wanted to write, because it didn't exist. So I thought I'm going to have to research it and write it myself. And then there was a book. I was a professor of creative writing in one of the universities around London for seven years. And there's a book I wanted to write about how to write, which became the book titled How to Write Like Tolstoy. And then, in my time as a publisher, I'd edited, I don't know, 300 other people's novels. And I thought, well, maybe I'm now at an age when I can try a first novel. So I wrote 50 pages, a kind of mixture of some scenes and an outline, and gave it to my wife, who's also my literary agent. She wouldn't allow anyone else to be. And she said, the novel is worth continuing with, but you're not to write another word until you've written the book that you're commissioned to write. So I was very obedient to her, as I always am. Um, but I did, she didn't say anything about the book about writing. So I finished that, and that came out in 2015. But all that time, I was researching and reading the historian's book. Um, so the historian's book was finished. And then last Thursday, I gave her the completed novel. So all three have got done. Um, but I wouldn't advise anyone to be so stupid <laughs> as I was. Um, so can you just talk a little bit about what inspired you? I mean, you said that you wanted to write a book because it hasn't been written. Is it that simple to spend so much time on a, on a tome of this significance um, with something as simple as, well, it hasn't been written, so I want to do it? It sounds um, silly, but it was the same with the Sun book. I said earlier when the mics weren't working, so you may not have heard this, that I was brought up by Benedictine monks between the ages of 13 and 18. Yes, my father was a um, Jewish, as all his forebears were. His main uh, success in life was actually as a heavyweight boxer. He was a finalist in the British Championships. Um, but my mother was Irish Catholic, so this may not seem relevant to the answer, but <laughs> I was brought up as a Catholic, and in my late 20s, decided that this was not something I believed in any further. And so in my late 50s, or my early 60s, I thought, well, what else is important? The sun. <laughs> and I was signally ignorant about all matters scientific. People brought up by Benedictine monks generally are. Um, <laughs> and so I thought, it seems pretty important. And I looked for a book that wouldn't just be about physical, chemical makeup of the sun, or even how ancient astronomers um, had written about it. But I wanted to know about the sun in literature, sun in music, here comes the sun, um, sun in everything. Um, in fact, I was, at, I was meeting a friend um, in a New York hotel, and I was waiting for him. And I went in the bar and sat down in where there were five other seats. And um, no one was there, so I sat there to wait. And then a, a person in bright red tunic came and said, is this seat taken? I said, no. 
And then another person, a woman, in similar amazing garb, came and joined us. And it turned out that they were members of American Hunts. I don't know how senior they were, but they were you know, obviously um, sergeants of the hunt or whatever. And I said what I was doing. And one of them said, we hate the sun. So I said, well, why is that? And they said, well, when the sun comes out, hot air rises, and the dogs lose the scent of the fox, which is silly, but it's a fact I'd never have learnt unless I found myself surrounded by half a dozen masters of the hunt. Um, so that was, again, I'm afraid, me thinking, I want to read that book. It doesn't exist. And that's why I started on that, which is a 10-year haul. Fair enough. So we've got, I, I, I should have counted, how many profiles are in this book? Maybe 30 different chapters or, or so, each of which is about 20 pages long? The 70 to 80 historians who get something of a profile. Okay, fair enough. Um, how did you decide who to include and how, who to exclude? I mean, there's got to be a line at some point where uh, between all the filmmakers and documentarians and writers, uh, is this something that you did sort of arbitrarily based on people that you've known before or, or read about? How do you make that decision? Arbitrarily is the best <laughs> criterion um, because it's what all the historians do. Um, they select according to their own prejudices and areas of knowledge. Um, and I make the case in the book's preface that this is my selection. But the, the criterion, more seriously, was it's about who influences us over what we've understood to be the past. And I was determined that inasmuch the Veen books, I mean, for good or ill, not like mine, but there's a very good book published by a man called John um, Burrow, who was an Oxford don, a classicist, published by Knopf in 2009, called The History of Histories, which is much more historiography. It, doesn't really talk about the people who wrote those histories. And over a third of it is devoted to what he loves, classical Greece and classical Rome. And I wanted to not ex exactly attack the academy, to attack the universities, um, but to show that most historians or most people who have given us a sense of the past weren't professional historians, um, as a profession anyway, it didn't properly exist till the last quarter of the 19th century. But I wanted to include a chapter on Shakespeare. You know, our understanding of history is from his 38 plays, over half of which are histories. You know, the 14 Plantagenet kings and queens um, of England, um, not all of them, but a lot of them are Shakespeare's. Our sense of Richard III is Shakespeare's. Henry V, um, Richard II, and then, of course, Cleopatra, Julius Caesar, Mark Antony. They're Shakespeare's as much as anyone's. And I wanted to include, there's a chapter in the, on the historians of the Bible, the people who wrote um, the books of the, the Bible we would call history. Um, there's a chapter on historical novelists. Um, there's a chapter on journalists. They're people who have really made us say, yes, that's how I feel it to be. Um, I thought that the academy, when they came to review the book, would really say, well, what does this person know? He's never taught history in a, in a university. Um, but so far, they've been kind. Um, but that was, that was my criterion. Did you, um, did you work on one and finish it and set it aside? Or were you sort of you know, working on all of them at the same time and, and sort of coming to a crescendo and, and just sort of uh, you know, dotting your I's and, uh, across all, all the various profiles? A bit of both. I mean, I was very intent to make sure it wasn't just a compendium of short biographies. And there are definite themes in the book, which we can uh, talk about if that's one of your questions. But it was a bit of both. I mean, for instance, I went to talk to a friend called uh, Philippe, Philippe Armesto, who was a Spanish historian. And he said, oh, Richard, you're not going to be so boring as to start with Herodotus. So of course, I thought, yeah, boring? Well. I mustn't be boring. Um, and I have started with Herodotus. 
And I thought, well, why don't I choose something really different and choose something which is, in summary, about as boring a subject as an American audience could ever think of about someone you've never heard of. Um, he's prof Regis Professor of, of History at Cambridge. His name was David Knowles. And he was an expert, wrote you know, over a dozen books on religious life in England and Wales from 800 to 1500, pretty large expense. But he was absolutely thought of as the great historian of his day. But what led him to write in the way he did? So that, for instance, over the dissolution of the monasteries, he felt and wrote, they had it coming to them. They were you know, gluttonous, greedy, immoral for the most part. They didn't believe in the rule of St. Benedict at all. And I thought, that's good stuff to write about. But what was interesting is he'd actually been a Benedictine monk at the abbey where I was educated and tried to foment a rebellion there because he didn't feel the monks who taught me, um, taught me history, weren't living according to the life of St. Benedict. And so he brought that prejudice, that agenda, to the way he then wrote about history and became this you know, cultural icon for his in his day, but wrote highly prejudiced history. So I thought, I'll start with him, and that will body that major theme of the book, which is how all these historians who we know, love, hate, had these tremendous agendas, sometimes which they were very conscious of. And after all, some of the best works of history are written by people with major prejudices. Um, and sometimes they didn't know that they were prejudiced, which makes their work all the more interesting. Were, were there um, individuals that you wanted to profile but couldn't? I mean, at some point, and I, as a professional editor, I would love to know who edited your book and how, you know, I know that there's always some tension between editors and authors. Um, as a professional editor, how do you deal with your own editor saying, this, Richard, this is too much. We're going on 800 pages. We've got to scale it back. Or well, it was much more than 800 pages when it started. The best editor in my life um, is my literary agent, um, who, as well as doing amazingly every aspect of what an agent is meant to do, get a decent contract with a decent publisher, decent sum of money, and follows up on everything. Um, but she's also my wife. And um, she is a very strict editor, but knows that when she edits me, I'm like a bear with a sore head until I realize that she's 95% right in everything she said. So down the margins of my script, my beautiful script, would be, she uses a green pen, would be these little dancing figures. <laughs> Animals, um, her in a kind of green skirt and so on, just to cheer me up as she edited me. <laughs> um, but I also had some very good editors. Um, first of all, Random House, then Simon and & Schuster, and certain friends who um, made sure they told me the truth rather than acting kindly. Um, so do you have a, um, a favorite individual here that you profiled or, or, or someone who's, who your research led to maybe some unexpected discoveries, things that you weren't necessarily anticipating? Um, um, those are two different questions. I think I can bind them into one answer. I was really ignorant of a thing called the Anal School. Now, looking at these intelligent faces in front of me, you've probably all heard of the Anal School. You can see people nodding, so I won't ask how many hands will go, should go up. But it was that group of people brought together by two Frenchmen, um, Lefebvre um, and um, Marc Bloch, starting in 1929, when they founded this magazine of history called the Annales, from which the group got their name. And it went on running up into the student riots at the end of the 60s. And they really changed the way history was written about worldwide. And what I learned was how I loved the books and I loved the person of Mark Bloch. Lefebvre was impressive and wonderful. Um, people used to describe them. Um, they're different in age by about 20 years, but bickering like a married couple. They worked together for such a long time. But Mark Bloch um, was a hero in the First World War, 
Um, and in the second, in his mid-50s, volunteered to fight in the second and was an, a major figure in the resistance. And eventually, he was discovered and taken to a field um, at the crack of dawn by his Nazi captors. He was um, examined, if that's the right word, tortured by Klaus Barbie and shot dead that morning. And he was an extraordinary teacher, but the moral quality of his life um, and his writing, I thought, for me anyway, um, is unforgettable. And then um, one of the things, even in writing a book like this, is um, how to use I, how to use oneself as a kind of companion to the reader. Um, um, my wife is um, um, absolutely vigilant on striking out I whenever she can see it. But she does admit that sometimes it can be useful to have author as friend, not as dictator. Um, and so I write about another person whom I deeply admire um, called John Keegan, um, the military historian, whom I knew and whom I edited, um, unfortunately, only about three books. Well, John, dead now for a decade, um, when he was 11, um, was diagnosed with TB, which was then a, a killer illness. Um, but although he did eventually get treated for it, um, a cure came along thanks to two academics at Rutgers University. John, throughout his life, went, you know, his back, he was a kind of question mark by the time um, he died. Um, he loved things military. His father had been in, um, been in the First World War, but he obviously couldn't serve. When he applied to do national service, the doctors laughed at him. Um, but he had this romantic notion of what it was to fight in war. But it was romantic in one way and not in another, because when he was ill um, and being treated before the Rutgers University break breakthrough, he found himself in a ward with squaddies, infantrymen um, from the Second World War, real working class uh, soldiers who'd been at the sharp end. And they kind of adopted him, little Johnny, they used to call him. And he learned to have an extraordinary and right admiration for the courage and lack of self-pity of the people in that ward. And so when he started to write books about war, he had this romantic notion of what soldiering was, was like, but also a very real and, I think, morally courageous center to his writing about what war was like. And he wrote his breakthrough book, was The Face of Battle, which made him famous, certainly throughout the English-speaking and reading world. And it was that moral quality to his writing that people found remarkable, and I found remarkable, um, which I've given, a, I've given a, a, a chapter devoted to him in the book. But it's also the theme of how sometimes physical disability um, whether it's disease or, or, or accident or whatever it might be, can shape the way that a historian writes about his subject. Um, <clears throat> can I ask you about uh, one of my favorite uh, chapters, chapter 15, Churchill and his factory? Um, so the concept of the history maker being responsible for the history. And you, um, you write that, that Churchill was very much aware and loved that sort of power that he could more or less describe his, his, his actions in a way that would be sort of beneficial to his, his legacy. And also this concept where, um, you know, he was making a, a decent salary based on all of his writing. So it, it behooved him to write a lot, and he wrote a lot about himself. In fact, I think you mentioned that Churchill's writings were more than Shakespeare, and I forgot one other author's uh, c combined. Dickens, I think. Dickens. So that's a lot. Anyway, a, a, a fascinating chapter. Can you talk a little bit about that? He, he didn't get a, a, a decent salary. He got an absolutely indecent one. <laughs> um, 
you'll read in the book, I can't remember it now, the amount of money he got through. I have one footnote. I must warn you, I love footnotes. And it used to be, when I went into publishing in the early 1970s, you were not allowed you, to let authors put in footnotes because it was hand-setting, and they, were, they added horribly to the printing bill. But now, with different styles of setting, all electric or whatever it might be, it's no more expensive than the rest of the text. And so I've got one long footnote, which is simply Churchill's drink bill in 1937. <laughs> and you think, how could he consume it all? Um, and the details of what he got through um, up until the time with supper finished, he then went to his study, poured himself the first of a number of whiskies, and started dictating um, one of his books. And his secretaries used to have certain special muffled typewriters so as not to disturb his thought. Well, um, you'd think that there's no more to say about Churchill. Andrew Roberts' 1,100-page um, uh, biography, which came out two or three years ago, he reckoned was the 1,100th biography on Churchill. There was another very good one published only this year by Jeffrey Wheatcroft. And there seems to be no end of them, rather like books on Lincoln. But just devoting a chapter to Churchill the historian and how he put his books together, I found was fascinating. And I got all kinds of little bits and pieces. Um, for instance, from the Andrew Roberts book, that uh, Churchill, his life long, never had to use a telephone. He always had people who did it for him. Until in his 70s, he wanted to know the time. So somebody told him the phone number of the I Speak the Time. And he rang it up, got the electric answer, and thanked <laughs> before he put down the receiver. Or um, his dentologist, who used to be able to tell how the war was going, because Churchill, who had been given this set of teeth, um, ostensibly to cure his lisp, because he didn't find it politically uh, good, um, put in the dentures and found that it cured them so perfectly that the lisp disappeared completely. And he said, no, I want another pair, because I think a bit of lisp is very good politically. <laughs> but when the, when the war was really going badly, and he lost his temper at something, they'd take out his dentures and throw them at his secretaries across the room. And then they'd have to go for a pair. Um, but somebody said, look, um, I, you come to me, journalists, you come to me and said, he's got this factory of people researching, people writing drafts, um, some um, illegally seized pieces of government papers um, he's taken and quotes them verbatim without quotation marks uh, in his books. Um, he's not really the author of all this mass of words. And um, the person who was one of the kitchen group said, it's like asking a chef, did you prepare, did you chop the onions, did you prepare um, the carrots? No, but it's the master chef who oversees the entire meal. And Churchill is not only like that, that if you make a, a mistake in grammar or you're wordy or repetitive, he'll be on to you um, and no one gets away um, so that the final version, whether you like Churchill's writing now or not, remember, they were the monster bestsellers in America and in Britain, and pretty well throughout the English-speaking world of their day. These are, it's Churchill's tone of voice, Churchill's style of writing. Thank you for sharing that. I wanted to ask you, although you touched upon um, Shakespeare as a historian, um, I want to make sure that we've got time for audience questions, but I want to make sure that um, I get to all my questions. <laughs> So I'm going to put a, a pin in, in the Shakespeare as historian, but that's a, just a fascinating concept where people are, Shakespeare's fiction is, uh, is influencing how people um, interpret the, the British royalty and how people understand Roman history. I, I think that that was really a, just a fascinating aspect of your, of your book. But I want to sort of fast forward to the future, unless you want to talk about uh, no, Shakespeare I, anymore. No, I know you said you've got lots of questions, so you're going to curse <laughs> me if I don't allow you. You know, yeah. um, if I spend you know, a week reading your book, you can at least uh, spend 45 minutes answering my questions. Um, I wanted to, to get to, to present day history. Um, 
and I think you talked a little bit about it in your reading about, around bad history. But before we get to bad history, um, you spent some time um, focusing on video and photographic historians. Uh, you spend a good amount of time on Ken Burns. And I remember a quote in the book, I don't know if it was yours or somebody that uh, you attributed, saying that uh, more people have learned about the Civil War from Ken Burns' documentaries uh, than by any other means. Now, one, one type of historian that you didn't profile was uh, really the art historian. Um, thinking over the, uh, the, the uproar that has taken place over the past decade around statues and monuments and the history that, that statues tell, um, uh, was that ever a consideration of yours in, in, in the book, to, or, or did it just or was that sort of outside of the scope of what you wanted to write about? Well, that's great. That's three questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, you want the book to be even longer? It, I mean, I could have written um, uh, about art historians. Um, I particularly think I should have written about Carlyle, but he's such an anti-Semite, maybe I let my prejudices uh, show. Um, there are so many people, I mean, you know, if you go home tonight and meet someone in your family and you say, You'll, I went to this lecture and, uh, um, you know, this speaker kept on going on, not answering all the questions. Whatever you're doing, you're, in that sense, a historian. You're selecting and shaping an account of the past. So we all do it. Um, and um, I could certainly, I mean, archaeology, anthropology, uh, there's so much, so many different disciplines. One of the things about the Annal Group is their basic tenet was we want to join hands with, with sociology, economics, all, all these social subjects, and regard that as history telling, and, large, uh, and uh, regard that as a way of explaining the past. So, in a sense, there's no end to it. Um, and you just say, well, We've got to save trees for other books <laughs> somehow. Um, on Shakespeare, I mean, he, um, I say in the preface, the different reasons it caused people to write works of history, um, religious beliefs, political beliefs, um, patronage, whatever it might be. Um, Voltaire wrote works of history despite his lover, who when he wrote his, because his lover, this famous countess, was a scientist, a brilliant scientist and mathematician. And when Voltaire wrote a work of history, she stole it and hid it because she didn't approve of him writing history. Get back to science. Um, um, so there was history being written out of uh, a love battle. But Shakespeare wanted to advance the Tudor, the Tudor cause. Now, most historians want to write in order to be paid for it, whether it's expected as part of their tenure or the money they get from their publishers, money, again, Samuel Johnson's great, the only blockhead doesn't write for money. Um, but Shakespeare also knew that unless he put a spin on his plays and recounting recent history, but not such recent history as to be politically dangerous, um, well, you can tell how I'm going. So Shakespeare was an arch propagandist as well as being all the other things we know. The writers of the Bible, the Bible is full of the most extraordinary history, is culturally as important as any other book that's ever been published. But it's the work, the history part anyway, it's a work of propaganda. And I lay out um, in my book um, why that's now the received wisdom amongst biblical scholars. Um, so um, propagandizing propagandizing your particular view of the past and the particular thoughts you have about the present is an absolute driving force for a huge amount of history. Now, when it comes to, as you were, question number three, I don't know whether Ken Burns is a propagandist um, in the way that Shakespeare or uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, whatever, are, um, but he has a vision of what showing what the past was like should be. He got from his parents a deep sense of the importance of storytelling and of narrative, which from the time he started making films to the, the present 
um, was not necessarily what the academy believed history writing was about. And Ken Burns and his great friend um, um, Lewis Gates, um, Henry Lewis Gates, they above all else felt you've got to make people turn the page or the equivalent in watching film. You've got to tell the story, um, a good story, and in a sense, if, you, if he was a propagandist, the importance that he felt that had is paramount in everything he's done. But I do think, though, I mean, he would agree to certain criticisms, even of his wonderful Civil War um, series. Um, I do believe he's a, a great historian of our time. Um, <clears throat> speaking of, of propaganda, I was, um, I was surprised to see um, in the book two examples of photographs, one of Stalin and one of Eisenhower, um, that were essentially photoshopped uh, to produce a more desired outcome of, of the subjects. Um, before we turn it over to, uh, to the audience, can you maybe just talk a little bit about the future of history, um, especially as technology gets better and better and it's easier to Photoshop um, uh, people out of photos or into photos? Well, history will continue to be the work of propagandists. You only need to take in Richard Socks to realize uh, what a propagandist for the importance of the word and the letter Richard is. Um, <laughs> I'm very jealous of them. Um, I think that people say, will history be better written in the future, given the internet? It's not the, the bad side of the internet um, and the problem that we feel we don't know what is truth or what is, what is false news, and the absolute lack of confidence we have in various kinds of people, various institutions, because of that current problem. But, you know, researching, I could, at the press of a button, solve an awful lot of the queries I had, um, whether it's um, not just um, annoying dates I wanted to discover, um, but um, research papers in obscu obscure journals uh, that just is not, wasn't possible certainly not even 20 or quarter of a century ago. So one would think that just the sheer ability not only to discover knowledge, but to send it to friends, authorities, people who are going to read and comment. This must improve things. And I said to Simon Sharma, who's again um, a great hero of mine in terms of Simon Sharma writing at his self-indulgent best, um, and he said, historians aren't going to get any better you can't improve on Fernand Brodel, again, a central figure in the Annal school story. Um, that quality of imagination, he trained, first of all, as a doctor, then he wanted to be a novelist. So you've got the analyst qualities of a doctor, um, the imaginative qualities of, of a novelist, uh, along with all the abilities um, he has uh, as a historian. You're not going to do better than that, whatever the internet allows you to do. So you may get a general improvement in the overall range of histories that we're given, but the best historians of the past, um, it's like the best soccer players or the best baseball players. I don't think they're going to be better. Um, maybe the last question for me for now. Um, you talk a little bit uh, about sort of the suppression of history um, and your real world example, I think you mentioned uh, the 1619 Project and how uh, that book is now, I believe, banned in two states. And then this idea of critical race theory, which is not taught anywhere, is now can't be taught in at least half a dozen states. Um, can you talk about how your book might add to the conversation about how history is, is, is taught, I suppose? Um, the I think one of the things in my book, I certainly didn't set out to do this, but I think it's there, is it tells you how history gets written and why it gets written. And you know, it's in no way intended as a textbook. Again, it's uh, me telling stories. But you get a sense of, I begin with an epigraph, an epigram from um, British historian E. H. Carr saying, he who would first know history must look at the historian. So to that extent, it teaches people not to be credulous. 
not to take one book or one version of history, but to take several. Um, and indeed, crucially, to look at the historian, their character, their upbringing, the influences on them, in order to get a, a, a greater sense of the truth. And I, I, you know, I talked about um, uh, uh, Z changing Chinese history, um, Putin having spent years um, trying to do that in schools, universities, let alone what's happening over um, the propaganda coming um, um, from the Kremlin over the, the war in Ukraine. But um, Trump, you've got in America an absolute split. Um, I won't say it's divided in half, because what do Native Americans think about the teaching of history in schools and colleges? They may think that the so-called split is absurd because it doesn't take in um, their view, or Hispanics equally. Um, but when one thinks of um, critical race theory, again, you know, you can't say that Donald Trump has got a great sense of history, or he'd remember that in 1994, there was um, a report by the teaching of history in schools and colleges that said that women's history had to be taught in those establishments, and minorities' history had to be taught. And it wasn't then um, African-American history that was a great talking point. You had Lynn Cheney, um, the great darling uh, uh, of some Democrats now, and in some ways rightly so, at the very forefront of the fight against having more women's history taught in schools. So what goes around comes around. For sure. Um, <coughs> I was going to also ask this, uh, <laughs> just the concept of nostalgia um, and, and the weaponization of nostalgia to sort of bend history. Uh, you mentioned Trump and uh, something like Make America Great Again or the good old days how we sort of think back to history and make it better than it actually was and what that does for future generations, um, I just think is a really fascinating topic. Oh, it is fascinating. Then you know, every country, as I was saying, requires its myths. Um, there's a Chinese historian of the 1920s, I certainly can't pronounce his name, but I, um, who researched into it and said, the first 2,000 years of Chinese history, a total fabrication. <laughs> um, you know, um, and I don't know when this was done, but a poll of Americans um, a few years ago discovered that 43% of those in the poll believed that Elvis Presley was still alive. Um, but this isn't me being British criticizing America, I'm a citizen of both countries, but there was a poll of a whole range of school children a few years ago as to who was real, um, who a product of nostalgia. And the poll came out with a majority saying, well, King Arthur was, yes, certainly existed. And Robin Hood, wonderful, courageous figure. Winston Churchill, <laughs> no, no, no. Sher Sherlock Holmes is true, but Winston Churchill is just a fabrication. Um, so what people in the future will believe and not believe, um, it may be a necessary untruth. Does it really hurt that we think of King Arthur? Um, or even, you know, um, talking about the Bible. There's no evidence that we know who a particular King David was. Um, being king of a kingdom, it could have meant a small village or just some scattered um, uh, dwellings, you know. Um, but we all have a need for myths, and we have a need for, for heroes. That's the way that uh, people recount wars. Um, but again, if one says, you know, well, can we ever know what the truth is about the past? Um, and I quote the, the critic John Lukacs saying, history has two meanings. It's the past, and it's the way the past comes to us, whether it's through statuary or filmmakers or historians. It's a filter. It's somebody's version of the past. Um, overall, there'll be an accretion of different versions. So we'll say, yes, Hitler and Elvis are no longer with us, but why was Stonehenge built? How was it built? The jury is still out a bit. I love the quote in the book um, from Viet Thanh Nguyen, who is a great Vietnamese American author who read at the uh, DC Public Library. I think it said uh, something, uh, wars are fought twice, once on the battlefield and, and yeah. again in memory. 
And I just thought that was a, an amazing, amazing quotation. Anyway, um, we're at an hour now, so I do want to open it up and give you all time to ask questions or make comments. Um, the way we'll do it, uh, if you can speak up, um, and I will repeat the question so that people who might be watching online can hear it, um, and then we'll uh, uh, hand it over to Richard. Hi, uh, thank you very much for your illuminating talk. I have a couple of questions and observations. The first is regarding your title, Making History. Why did you, why do you think writing history or chronicling history? Now normally, in normal parlance, making history is when some major event, like breaking an Olympic record or something, is done. So is there a subtle suggestion there that when you're making history, there's fabrication involved? Um, it was done with deliberate intent, um, not necessarily saying all history making is a fabrication, but certainly it's something that has to be created. You talk about statuary, um, the first, I was very indulged, There's, there are over a hundred illustrations in the book, plus a color section, and the first um, picture in the color section is of a statue of Herodotus. It's totally made up. We don't know what Herodotus looked like. Nobody wrote about how he looked. It's just, he's a rather noble looking figure with a beard. Um, so making history was meant to implant at the very beginning the imaginative creative element in writing about the past. Um, and making the reader immediately um, not suspicious, but be on their toes. And it's making history rather than writing history because you know, at one point, I'm writing about the Bayeux Tapestry, um, something commissioned by the Normans after the 1066 invasion of England as a, as a propaganda piece, this huge great piece of tapestry. But they had to commission it from um, nuns in a Kentish convent so that it's one element, uh, in one way it's a piece of Norman propaganda saying how the dastardly um, English king had been dishonest um, and how wonderful the Normans are going to be as conquerors. But it's also throughout its length a piece of Kentish nuns propaganda fighting absolutely the other way. But I say, I say it may be the most important piece of narrative art history. So I have to say, writing and doing tapestries on history. I, you know, it's, we get history from so many different means. And that was why I chose the title I did. I just have a follow up question, which is, do you ever believe that history can be written entirely truthfully? Because those who try to do that are threatened with death. I mean, you have Salman Rushdie's book on Prophet Muhammad, well, I hope I'm not saying anything incendiary here. Based on facts, he was given a fatwa, he had to go into hiding for 10 years. The director mentioned critical race theory, which is being taught in this country. In, in this country, which is supposedly one of the more open societies in the world, there's been a huge backlash, which is threatening to Uh, sp speaking to the mic, we're getting yeah, a request. Yeah, uh, you know, the, the critical race theory the director mentioned, in, in America there's been a huge backlash against the teaching, which is a truthful telling of slavery in this country. And so my question is, do you ever think with these kind of backlashes to people who try to tell the truth and chronicle history in truth, is it ever going to be possible to really write history which is entirely factual. Thank you. Um, I was at university with Salman Rushdie and had meals with him during the time that he was, um, the fatwa was you know, causing him to, uh, to live a totally secret life. And I, I know the toll that it's, it took on him. Um, but throughout the book, I write, I, I mean, um, the, the um, 
critical race theory and the 1619 battles are just one battle. Um, I write about two and a half thousand years of people who are trying to tell the truth about the past as they saw it um, and the battle they had to be properly heard um, and to live without being persecuted. Um, uh, and um, whether you choose Trotsky or Edward Gibbon or, or, or people trying to write history um, in Islamic countries, um, what was done to um, the people who tried to tell the truth is two and a half thousand years uh, of horrible stories and acts of great courage as well. And then there's a question which I didn't go into is whether you can be objective as a historian. And I say that you know object, objectivity um, is an agenda too. And there's a wonderful moment in a Tom Stoppard play, Night and Day, when one of the journalists says, well, my paper, you know, we are objective. We are objective. And his fellow journalist says, yeah, yeah, but are you objective for or objective against? <laughs> But yes, the reason why it's difficult to, hold, to hear you is because you're so impassioned about the injustice against historians, you got carried away. <laughs> uh, but I can uh, sympathize why. Um, we'll, we'll go back and then we'll start moving forward. Do you want to talk about the suppression of women's voices throughout history? How did you deal with that? That makes all histories in some sense? Um, I deal with it because um, my wife and my daughter approved of the drafts. <laughs> I didn't want anyone to be a ghetto, so there's a great deal about black historians that goes throughout the book, even though there's one chapter devoted to it. And it's the same with um, a, a sex which makes up more than half of humanity. So there is a chapter called Her Story, um, which is about how women were grossly neglected and discriminated against until, with just a handful of exceptions, um, you know, deep into the 19th century. Um, but I do also, in other parts of the book, talk about major female historians. But I also talk about it's not just the battle that women had to be allowed to write and publish works of history, but to write about women. And the problem is that libraries are great political institutions, that people overseen by Richard choose what should go into a library and what shouldn't go into a library. So that certain Roman emperors didn't like Livy's writings and Tacitus' writings and banned them from, I think there were 11 libraries in ancient Rome under Augustus Caesar. Um, so places of learning are themselves political strongholds of selectivity and prejudice. However broad band their final decision making is. And if you're writing about, for instance, a woman in the American Civil War, her diaries, her letters, um, her writings may have been destroyed, or if they haven't been destroyed, you'll find them archived under their husbands, their lovers, their male family. So the whole business of writing women's history is a battle and continues to be so. Right over here, I think Lou. Lou, did you have something? Can you uh, give them the mic there, David? How much do you have to do your own research and reach your own judgments about the periods you're talking about? That is, you know, Tacitus, Livy, Gibbon, Shakespeare, Mary Beard, all right about Rome. Do you have to become a Roman historian to judge their work or not? Yes, in fact, I came dressed in a toga, which is I couldn't in front of this audience. Um, well, you've got to have empathy for the historians you write about. Um, and you've got to read all you can. Um, I think every day of the how little I know about the subject and how I, you know, forgotten stuff that I read 10 years ago. Um, but you know, you take a historian like Edward Gibbon, um, well partly it's a work of prejudice because 
he was so physically, um, I've got to watch what's right way of describing it. People described him as being incredibly ugly. He was four foot eight. He had all kinds of physical complaints. Um, he, there was a, a woman in Paris who was one, held wonderful soirees, and she was blind towards the end of her life, and she used to get new people to her evening meetings to present their faces um, that she'd feel with her hands to get a sense of who they were. Well, Gibbon had these puffed-out cheeks and snub nose, and, um, and she felt his face and thought that he was absolutely rude and presenting his bottom to her. <laughs> so there's Gibbon choosing this hedonistic society, ancient Roman society, and you get the powerful irony in Gibbon's writing because he's getting his own back in talking about the decline of these people who were so physically blessed. But you also get this person um, who um, had a university converted to Catholicism until his father brought him back into line in chapters 15 and 16 of the Decline and Fall, writing about how it was Christianity that was responsible for the decline of this great, of this great culture. Um, so you've got to have a sense of what was behind Gibbon's writing and to see the world through Gibbon's eyes to an extent to be able to put a sympathetic spin on, on how he wrote. Right here. Uh, what do you? Uh, I think I'm, I w find most fascinating uh, are, say, the historical liars who, you know, are deliberately kind of trying to alter alter the truth and alter the record. Uh, what do you think are the uh, say one or two greatest uh, misconceptions about some really major historical event that almost everybody believes because of? Uh, you know, active propagandizing by somebody with, with, by successful historians with an agenda. One of the things I had to do in the book, which is true, of a lot, I wouldn't say all, but by far the majority of nonfiction books, is to, you were asking earlier about structure, is to keep a chronological sense, because one of the s smaller themes is how the actual writing of history developed over the decades, over the centuries, um, and to talk about themes. Um, and um, um, I've forgotten um, how this, and I decided that I wanted to choose for one chapter an example of one moment in history where you get a kind of palimpsest of different views, not necessarily falsifying, but one particular view of history, then another one, and another one. And I was going to answer your question by saying, what about the First World War? the causes of the First World War. Um, who's to blame for the First World War? I thought, well, I could choose that, or the Second World War, or the French Revolution, and I could have brought in Carlyle. I thought, no, um, as a sop to my publishers and my American wife, I'd choose the American Civil War. And you get, after the war, even during the war, um, for the next 60 years, you get the South's version of what the war was fought, who was in the right, um, how hard, by, hard done by the South was. And the Dunning School, um, and Dunning, there's still a Dunning History Prize. Um, my wife was saying, what history prizes do you think in your conceit you want to go in for? And I said, well, I could go in for the Dunning Award, but I don't think they're going to award it. <laughs> um, and, you know, pupils of Dunning, and PhD students of his, went on to populate um, American universities in, in the North as much as the South. But then you get not just um, the current view, um, where most people would say that slavery was absolutely at the center of why the war was fought, but you get um, Beard, the American uh, husband and wife team, saying that the importance of slavery is worth a sentence. Um, I'm giving you a communist reading of why the, the Civil War was fought. You get um, the agriculturalist view or why the war was fought. And so you do get this kind of palimpsest of different views, some of which are propagandizing, some of which are just historians writing as much from their understanding of the evidence as they see it. Um, but you get this 
wonderful range of views. Um, and probably, unfortunately, there were certainly textbooks I've seen that were being used in the South in 1960, which was the paternalist view of the South and the happy enslaved people there. <coughs> we have maybe time for one more question? Or we have time for signing books. All right. Um, so I think we're going to end there. Thank you uh, for your questions, folks. Um, Richard, thank you on behalf of librarians and readers everywhere for writing such a phenomenal, entertaining, and enlightening uh, tome. Um, I can't wait to, uh, to share it with, uh, with friends and, and relatives. So thank you very much, everyone. Round of applause for Richard Cohen. Thank you all for joining us online. Please visit us again at dclibrary.org where you can see this talk and many other presentations that we've done in the past that are now history and those that we'll do in the future. So thanks again. <laughs>